Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Matt 1841. It looks like a pretty sparse audience today, so I assume most of you will be uh, viewing this on YouTube later. Uh, so, what did we do last time? Last time, well, we showed that components in an Erdős Rennie random graph for a particular probability distribution were either of size O of log n or at, um, on the uh, a large fraction of n itself. And we're going to finish off that part of the random graph theory lecture today before moving on to percolation theory. And so what we're going to do is let me switch back to the previous slide. And we're going to show that there are no other large components. So no other large components. And so our claim is that with high probability, uh, there's only one big component. So for uh, just as a reminder, we are working in the random graph uh, G of NP, where P is one plus epsilon over N. So you have, uh, and we want to show that there uh, is only one large component. So for any epsilon greater than zero, we have let P uh, NP equal one plus epsilon over N. With high probability, there is only one giant component. Giant component in G of NP. Uh, so, and all other components, components have size O of log N. Okay, so basically what we're trying to show is that there, it, you can't happen, it can't happen that you have two big components that just don't have any edges between each other. And this argument is actually fairly straightforward because it's just a simple counting argument. Um, we're just going to show that there are too many possible edges between two big components. And so with high probability, there is some edge between them, which makes them just one component. So, well, let's suppose that it has a non-trivial probability. Suppose G of NP has a delta probability of two distinct components. Distinct components, well, let's call them K1 and K2, of size omega log n, so bigger than a log n. And uh, well, what we're going to do is we're going to let A be the set of nodes from one through epsilon n over two. Okay, so this is uh, some arbitrary set of size uh, epsilon n over two. Well, then how much does this set that we've just constructed, so this arbitrary set intersect with k1 and k2? Well, then it turns out that the probability that k1 intersects a uh, is equal to omega log n. And the probability that k2 intersects a is also equal to um, uh, that this, the intersections both happen. Uh, but the sizes of these intersections are at least omega log n is greater than or equal to delta over two. Sorry, I think I might have misspoken there a bit. Hey, welcome. So what we're trying to show is that there's some fairly high, by fairly high we mean uh, bounded away from zero probability that both of them intersect the set A in a set of size at least log n. Oh, why is this true? This is true because we can just randomly permute the vertex labels. So we can randomly permute vertex labels. And we know that both K1 and K2 have epsilon over four fraction of their nodes, of their nodes in A. And the expected number of, of we, we say this because in expectation, there's at least epsilon over two fraction of their nodes in A. Okay, so what, all we're saying is that there's some big intersection between this set we've just defined, the set A, which is an arbitrary collection of epsilon n over two nodes, and each of these two big giant components. Uh, so now what we want to show is that, so basically any giant component has to intersect um, with high probability this arbitrary set A uh, in many nodes. And we want to show that there can only be one such component uh, that intersects in that many nodes. And that would show that there's only one large component. So we want to show only one omega log n component that intersects A in omega log n vertices. 
Okay, well, now let's let B be the complement of A. So every all the other nodes. So this is the majority of the nodes. And so then the size of B is equal to N times one minus epsilon N over two. Okay, so this is all the rest of the nodes that aren't in A. Well, we know that B has at least one giant component, component C star, where C star is equal to omega of log n. Why is this? Well, because we proved the existence of a giant component, and this is basically all the nodes in A. And so there's probably a big uh, component in B, since we only subtracted out a very small fraction of the nodes in B, uh, uh, in the, the graph at large. Okay, now, well, let's assume we're going to uh, list out all of the big components in A. Uh, B omega of log n, components with an A. Well, then we know that for all I, there are omega n log n potential edges. Well, that's an omega layer. Potential edges between CI and C star. Okay, this is just because we have this giant component and we're asking, well, given that we have this giant component in B and we have all these small components in A, well, what's the chance that um, uh, there's an intersection between the small component in A and this big component in uh, B. When uh, we can just uh, look, count the number of potential edges, and what we'll see is that, well, there are a lot of potential edges. Each of them has independent probability of existing. And so long as one of those edges exists, the two uh, components are connected. So uh, when the probability that CI is not connected, to C star is less than or equal to one minus P times omega of N, something that's omega of N log N, which turns out to be equal to one over N to the omega of one. Well, then all we need to do is use a union bound. So by union bound, all of our CIs are connected to C star with high probability. Right, this sort of makes sense intuitively, right? You have this giant component and you look at all these small components, but these small components aren't that small. They're all omega log n. And you look at how many possible ways they can connect to our giant component. And there are just too many possible places they can connect. And so if you flip coins enough times, you're going to get one with high probability that it does connect. And by the union bound, all of these small components of reasonably small components, omega log n components in A have to be connected to C star. But if all these small components are connected to C star, then that means all these small components are in the same component in the entire graph, right? Which means there's only one component in A that is omega log n. So when only one component, uh, and by saying that the component is in A, we mean a component of the graph itself, uh, of the graph itself. Uh, uh, let me do this in two steps. So only, only one component intersects A in omega log n vertices, which implies that there's only one large component, one large component in A. Okay, and that completes the proof. Um, yeah, so uh, just to recap, since this is finishing up our uh, series on air any random graphs, for this particular random uh, probability of having an edge of one plus epsilon over n, we proved last time that all the components are either small or really big. This time, well, well this was a relatively easy proof. We showed that you can't have two completely separate big components uh, because roughly speaking, they'll have too many possible edges between each other and the five probability one of those will connect with them and so you only have one big component. Okay, any questions before we move on to uh, percolation theory? So more general. Um, so percolation theory is going to start talking about other types of models of random graphs that have some biological applicability. I mean, not just biological, physical applicability. Um, okay, so let's uh, go on. Let me switch back to my new set of notes since this is a new topic. So percolation theory. So now we've spent the last week now on 
uh, and basically all the time on random graphs for each vector has was free to connect to every other uh, sorry each vertex was free to connect to every other vertex with some probability but now this isn't really that realistic in the physical world there might be geometric constraints so there might be only some set of potential neighbors you can connect to and so uh, we're going to consider some, uh, conductivity through a material um, and the term percolation theory comes from fluids going through uh, percolating through a solid material through little open channels in it. So let me draw it out. So let's see the term percolation theory. Theory comes from material science and it comes from open or closed channels for a fluid to flow. So you might be wondering what this has to do with graph theory, uh, but uh, what we're going to do is let, let's assume we have a big rock. Um, I should have gotten the prop of a rock, but I set it on the desk here. And then it starts raining, like it sort of is drizzling outside. So it starts raining. And one question you might ask is how much, oh, let me start drawing that. So let's say we have a big rock, okay? Of some arbitrary shape, it doesn't really matter. Um, let me draw a slightly nicer rock. Okay, so we have a big rock. And what we're trying uh, asking is, if it starts raining outside, does the water go through the rock? So can the water go from the top of the rock and uh, go through the rock all the way down into uh, to the other side? So is there a puddle here? Is basically our question. Now, the answer to that is a little bit hard to, uh, like in practice, there are all sorts of things that could happen. We're going to create a simple model of a rock. We're gonna create a model of a rock as a bunch of in points. Uh, so let's say we have a bunch of points and uh, well, it might take me, actually, let me draw these slightly wider so I don't have to draw as many dots. So let's say we have, a, a, we divide this up into a bunch of points. And these are going to be the, the, the nodes, but you can sort of think of these as like blocks of rock. Um, and uh, or, or, sorry, as like holes in the rock. And the question is, are they connected to each other? And so then you can draw a, um, you can say with some probability, each of these holes is connected by a channel to the, to well, all the other holes. And so maybe we have uh, connections, let's say here, 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 here. And we'll say they're randomly scattered. And so this is where the random graph theory part of this comes into play. Um, in this particular case, we the vertices are all fixed to begin with, but we have random edges between neighboring vertices. Uh, let's see. I'm not very good at random number generation, but that's true of most humans. So, and uh, yeah, let's say that's there. And so the question is, does there exist a path that goes like this? So this path goes all the way, well, let's say goes down all the way to the bottom. And so the question is, does such a path exist? So. Is there an open path? An open path. And by open, we just mean that water can pass through it. So I'll be using this open and closed terminology basically because we want to think of the edges as well, you can always describe an edge between any two of these vertices. And we're basically going to say that an edge is open if water can flow through it. Uh, you can also think of open as an existent edge. And if it's closed, there's no edge there. Um, but this is just a slight difference in terminology because, well, of history. So is there an open path? from top to bottom. It doesn't have to be from top to bottom. That's just because we're talking about this in the context of rain falling on the rock. Um, but the real question is, is the rock porous? And we're using this approximation here. So we're approximating, uh, we're approximating as a lattice, as a lattice. Um, and if you think about it, I've drawn these really, really big holes in rocks. Most rocks you see don't have holes that big, right? Like the holes are minuscule. Like even though water molecules can fit through them, they're not really that big compared to the rock itself. And so if the holes are very small compared to the rock and the channels are also very small, you can approximate this as an infinite lattice and just ask the question, can you go, is there an infinite path through um, uh, this lattice? So we're gonna approximate as uh, infinite lattice infinite lattice, infinite lattice, if the rock is much bigger than the channels. 
Okay, um, I guess I should label this. This is a rock. Um, this is rain. And uh, these are open channels. Okay, and so obviously for a single physical object, uh, the approximation of infinity isn't quite right. But as n gets really big, the chances that you're going to have a path of a really big length versus an infinite path length turns out to be negligible. That, that probability isn't actually that different. And so we, then now we have a way of, mathemat of mathematically modeling porousness in the rock. Um, and so uh, let's uh, now go back to math. So we're just going to consider a square lattice. People do work on other different lattice shapes. This is one of the standard things people work on in this area. It's just changing up the lattice shapes. What we're going to do is something simple. So we're just going to consider is that squared. Um, and so this is, and there are going to be two different models that people commonly use. Uh, we're going to be mostly focused, focused on this model, which is called the bond percolation model. So let's call this bond percolation. And what this is going to mean is all vertices are present, present, but edges, um, open edges, present with probability P. Okay, and so that's exactly what we were doing here. One, two, I'm just gonna draw four because drawing infinity takes a long time. And I don't have that long in this class. So a four by four lattice, imagine those are infinite. And we have some number of edges. So we have left maybe lat edge, lat edge, flare, 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 wherever. And the question is, do you have infinite paths that go from one end to the other? Oh, uh, there's another common form of percolation people also talk about, which is called site percolation. Does anyone want to hazard a guess as to what that is? So we've just uh, cho chosen the edges randomly. What other things are there to choose randomly when you're talking about a random graph in the lattice? Yeah, so we're just gonna choose the vertices randomly. So vertices present with probability P and all edges uh, present between neighbors. Okay, so that might look something like well, we start out with the same number of sites because we, we're working over the same lattice. But instead, what we're now doing is we're going to erase some of these um, sites. So if you erase those sites, uh, I'm going to draw them as empty holes. And then you connect together all neighboring vertices that are present. Okay, and so like these are both two different ways you can generate a um, random graph out of a lattice. So you start with a lattice and then you either randomly remove edges or you randomly remove uh, vertices. And either way you uh, create, you have some random graph and we can use the same sort of, of ideas that we've been studying random in the last week to analyze what happens to these graphs. And so remember, we spent a lot of time asking, is there a giant large connected component? And in some ways that's basically the question that we're asking here. Is there some connected component that reaches from one end to the other, which is, of course, quite similar to the question of is there a giant connected component? Um, and let's just take one more interlude back over to material science just to show that both of these are reasonable models. So uh, let's consider percolation in wires. So I'm going to draw a really, really fat wire uh, and have a cross section here. Uh, and so percolation in composite wires composite wires equals electrical con conductivity. And why might that be? Well, if you have a wire that's all made of, uh, I don't know, iron, for example. So it has a bunch of iron atoms. Iron is electrically conductive, right? And so if, it's if you have a wire that's entirely made of iron or entirely made of copper or something, well, then it's going to conduct electricity. But now let's suppose you have a wire and some of these are made of, some of these locations are made of iron and other ones are made of some non-conductive material. Okay, so you, you now have two different elements that make it made of your wire. And you might want this because some of these ele other elements might make it stronger. But then all of a sudden you have a mix of conductors and insulators. And so then the question is, is there some path that you can get from one end of the wire to the other that only touches iron? Because if you stop, if you hit an insulator, you stop. And so uh, in this way, the sort of site percolation problem is quite related to 
um, conductivity in a dope uh, conductor. Uh, you can also imagine something like this uh, working even for the bond percolation case. Let's say we have another wire here and uh, well, some polymers sort of, uh, let's say these are polymers that are scattered around. And let's say that there are iron atoms there, but we have polymers between some of the iron atoms. So, and it turns out that many polymers we use um, are insulating. Insulating, but you can get, you can make your wire a lot stronger to like bending or breaking, but you can get many of the, the you can get the strength of the polymer without needing it to all be that polymer. A polymer uh, without needing it to be homogeneous. Without needing homogeneity. So then we can dope it with a conductive filler. So maybe we put in a bunch of iron in between the uh, polymer uh, strands. Um, and um, well, this might be an example of bond percolation because maybe the insulator is only in between some of your uh, pairs of atoms, pairs of iron atoms or other conducting material. And so then you're breaking some fraction of the edges, but not all. Okay, so you can have site displacement. Uh, you can have site percolation if the sort of displacement is on a one-to-one -one basis. You're replacing an iron, you're replacing a conductive atom with an insulating atom. Uh, and you can have this bond percolation if you have some insulator that fits in between the conductive atoms um, and then breaks some edges, but not, uh, well, but not the, but doesn't like completely surround it at once. Okay, so that's the setup. Any questions? Okay, so let's do some more, let's do some math. What are the basic questions that we have to ask? So the basic question, there are several that you could ask. I can't spell questions, questions. So first there is the, uh, does there exist there exist, I can't really seem to spell delay. Does there exist an infinite open cluster? Does there exist an infinite open cluster? And you might also ask questions like, what are the size distributions of the clusters? Size distributions of open clusters. But for our purposes, we're mostly going to be looking for infinite paths because that, that's sort of the motivating uh, idea here, which is, can you go from one end to the other? Um, I should mention as an aside, because it's topical now, and it wasn't the last time I thought this, that there is some relationship between what we're doing here and some graph-based uh, epidemic modeling. Um, but those aren't really in vogue right now, so we're not going to cover it. So if those are in vogue right now, we might cover the graph-based epidemic models, but basically everyone is using SIR-based compartmental models, so ODE systems instead. Uh, just as an aside, but there were a while in the 2000s and early 2010s, people worked a lot on these sort of network models of epidemics and uh, they had some interesting results. Okay, but anyway, going back to uh, just the math. So we're going to do an edge percolation uh, problem. So let our 2D, uh, and we're going to do it in 2D, 2D edge percolation graph have, well, as the vertices, it's just going to be Z squared. Uh, and edges between all adjacent um, vertices with distance one. So that is vertically and horizontally, but not diagonally. Okay, and we're gonna say, let each edge be open, be open with probability P and closed with probability one minus P. So you might ask, why don't we just say they exist with probability P and they don't exist with probability one minus P? And you could, but that changes the language a little bit because we'll be talking about paths and then talking about uh, whether the edges along a particular path are open or closed. Whereas if you just said that that edge doesn't exist, then it becomes a little bit harder because then you have to start using the language of potential paths in the lattice that had those edges. And so we're just gonna assume that all the edges are in this lattice and only some of them are open. And we're gonna be focusing on that question. Okay, so well, let's define a couple of things. So well, let's let C of X denote the connected component, connected component 
X in a 2D edge percolation uh, in this graph. The component component X is in. Okay. And of course, this here is a random variable dependent on open edges. So whenever I talk about a component, I will be talking about an open component because it doesn't make sense to talk about a component that both, uses both open and closed edges since that's just the entire lattice. And of course, since this is an infinite lattice, well, you may as well just talk about the component um, C0 because uh, everything is equivalent by translation. Uh, and we're gonna define theta of P, which is gonna be the probability given uh, this uh, P parameter um, that the size of our component C, including the origin, is equal to infinity. So this is the probability that the origin is an infinite component. So if I start at one arbitrary point, which happen, we happen to call the origin, what's the chance that I can go out to infinity? Um, and uh, let's give a couple more definitions, just terminology before we get started. So we'll let PC be a constant such that for P is less than PC, theta of P is equal to zero. And for P is greater than PC, theta of P is greater than zero. Okay, so this is going to be our, oh. This is going to be our transition probability. So um, at the constant, above the constant, below the constant PC, you probably don't have, uh, the zero point is probably not in a connected component. Above it, it, it has some chance of it. So question, just to make sure everyone's still following, is there a P less than one such that theta of P is equal to one? Any thoughts? So let's suppose that P is equal to one half. Um, well, when the P is equal to one half, I am at the origin, right? And I'm connected with four edges. So what's the chance that all four of those edges are um, clo closed? Um, well, yeah, so it's one over 16, right? Yeah, and so because the origin is connected just out by only four edges, like no matter, like so long as P is less than one, there's always some chance that the origin just like is isolated because all four of the edges surrounding. So the answer to this is no. But you, you were sort of on the right track there the, um, because I was asking you, I was asking some whether the origin um, is in an infinite component, not whether the component, which is a different question altogether. And um, so let's give another aside, which is by Komogorov zero one law, the zero one law. And this states that tail events, tail events have either zero or one probability. If theta of P is greater than zero, must exist almost surely an infinite open component. And this is the reason why we only care about theta of P being uh, bigger or less than zero. So even though uh, if theta of uh, P is equal to 0 0.0001, so with very high likelihood, you don't have an uh, infinite cluster at zero. But of course we have this translation invariance idea of uh, like sense in which it, like the point zero was arbitrary. Well, we are on the infinite lattice. And so with high probability, I mean, Almost surely, uh, one of so there is some infinite lattice somewhere. Or sorry, some infinite component somewhere. Okay. Yeah, sure. So um, a moment ago, we were like, oh, well, if we have uh, some point here, there's some chance that all these are closed, right? And so for any p less than one, uh, well, theta of p can't equal one. But that that was actually only measuring the probability that the component at zero was infinite. It's not measuring the probability of whether or not there exists an infinite component. And it turns out, and this is something that you have to look in the, you can uh, look for it in the probability text. But basically the intuition is that, well, we only really care about if there exists an infinite component, not whether it's at zero. 
So, so long as the probability of having an infinite component is greater than zero at any point, because we have a bunch of different points uh, all scattered around an infinite, an infinite plane, with uh, almost surely, with probability one, there will be an infinite component somewhere. And so that's what makes this a little bit more interesting as a phase transition, right? Um, because what we're saying is that uh, there, uh, at this threshold, P sub C, below it, there is no infinite component uh, almost surely. And above it, there is an infinite component almost surely. Um, and the way we're doing that is we're measuring it at one particular point. As long as there's some non-zero probability, um, then it will be, uh, there will be an infinite component somewhere. So well, that means that, uh, and the, there's some sense in which your guess of one half is uh, a very reasonable guess for reasons that will become clear a little bit later. Um, uh, not so much for theta p equaling one, but whether or not there exists an infinite component. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So we want to figure out what this critical threshold is. We don't know what it is a priori. One half is a pretty good guess, um, but it turns out to be a really hard guess to prove. So let's start with some easier guesses. Uh, so. Let's see. Theorem. If P is less than one third, then theta of P is equal to zero. So we're basically going to say, well, P has to be at least one third. Uh, because if it's less than one third, then we, it's pretty easy to show that theta of P is equal to zero. Uh, and this proof will be using uh, something like the first moment method that we've talked about already for uh, air dash random graphs. So it'll be a slightly different flavor. So use something like first moment method. Oh, I should mention that uh, these lectures are not from your textbook. These lectures are based off of uh, some lecture notes uh, by Stipes that I have linked to uh, online. Um, so the notation will be a little bit different for that reason. Okay, so well, let's let F sub N be equal to the event that there exists uh, a self-avoiding path. Self-avoiding path of length n, a moment, okay, yep. So for the path of length n. What do we mean by a self-avoiding path? Just the path that doesn't cross itself. Um, of, of length n, um, oh, starting at zero. Starting at zero. And this is an event. Well, note that for any given, uh, Okay, um, let me add in the, an open layer. Yeah, so if avoiding open path. So for any given self-avoiding path, so that might not be open, path in Z squared, the probability that all edges are open is equal to, is equal to P to the N, right? Because uh, we we're just picking an arbitrary path in our lattice and then we're asking, are all the edges open? And so these are all independent random variables. So you just get P to the end. So that's pretty easy. Well, how many avoiding self-avoiding paths are there? The total number of self-avoiding paths, uh, paths in uh, of length n is less than or equal to four times three to the n minus one. Why is that? Because when you start at the origin, you can go in four different spaces. But after, uh, sorry, but then after that, you can't ever go backwards. And so clearly it's bounded by uh, three times n, three to the n minus one. And now uh, in order to actually compute the number, it's a lot harder because you need, to, you need to rule out like some complicated crossings, but certainly that's an upper bound. And that's all we really care about here is that we have an upper bound. So because, and it's four times three to the n minus one because you can't backtrack after the first step. So then the probability, of f sub n is certainly less than or equal to four times three to the n minus one uh, p to the n, but this goes to zero as n goes to infinity since p is less than one third. And so it was actually important that we had the three in the second piece. So you could have computed the total number of self avoiding paths and upper bound with four to the n, but then we would only be able to prove that uh, this is true for p is less than uh, one fourth. And so this way we can prove that for any p less than one third, the probability of the, of the event happening goes to zero as n goes to infinity. And therefore, uh, well, you know that the event that 
C, the uh, component at zero is has size infinity, well, that's certainly contained in the event that um, uh, Fn for all n. Because if the component is infinite, well, you can find some self avoiding path of length n uh, if you have an infinite component. And so, therefore, the probability that C is equal to infinity is equal to zero, which implies that theta of P is equal to zero, which implies that P sub C is greater than or equal to one third. Okay, so this, this is a fairly simple argument because all we were using is we were just using um, basically linearity of expectation and uh, uh, using that and some bound on the total number of paths. Um, and even with this, you, you, can, you can get pretty, a pretty good answer. You get that P has to be, a P, the critical P has to be greater than one third. Okay, and I will start on a more complicated theorem, but I'm not going to get done. It's like a full however many pages. Uh, so this is, uh, but we're, we want a tighter bound than one third. So that was an easy bound. And so let's start, let's take a look at some of the more complicated ways you can get a better bound. So this is a theorem of Harris in 1960. And the theorem is just theta of one half is equal to zero. Okay, so what this implies is that P sub C is greater than or equal to one half. Um, so this, this gets back to uh, your intuition that one half for, like it makes sense, right? That is some kind of critical transition point. Um, and it is the correct one for this case. Um, let me outline the argument and I might start proving a couple of lemmas, but we're not gonna get that far in because this is quite long. So there are several pieces that we'll have to use uh, beyond just the moment methods in order to prove this. Um, and they're going to, in some ways, be a lot more geometric than some of the other proofs you've seen. So the, for the erdos Renyi random graphs, there was no sense of geometry because everything was connected to everything. Here, we're able to make much better use of uh, the geometry of the lattice. And that, that's how we're actually going to show um, that theta of one half is uh, equal to zero. Um, if you think about it, this proof up here, this doesn't depend on geometry really much at all, right? All it depended on was that uh, it was a regular graph of degree four. So this proof up here is true for any regular graph of degree four. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why we can't actually do that much better using that method, because we're not making use of the structure of this particular example. So uh, we're gonna use several pieces. The first one is we're gonna use the self-duality of, of Z squared. Uh, what do we mean by that? So we have some graph, the, the status graph, and we're going to define a dual graph. So we can define a dual graph, a dual graph by translating down and to the right, to the right by, well, one half, one half. And we're going to define edges uh, in the dual graph to exist, or sorry, to be open precisely when they're closed in the uh, original graph. And defining an edge, an edge to be present in the dual when it does not cross an edge, an edge in the original. This will be a little more, more clear when I actually draw it. So let me draw out the graph. So let's say we have, uh, I'm going to draw it in four by four because it's hard to draw it in the graphs. Okay, and let's say this thing has edges, say here, 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 and okay, uh, let's also put in that one. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to translate down to the right. And so note that this gives you uh, another copy of Z squared. And the, uh, if there is an edge here, uh, then you don't draw the edge in the dual graph. So the dual graph is precisely complementary to uh, the uh, original graph. And note that I'm not drawing these edges here because I didn't actually draw out the original graph all the way out. Um, but so basically what this means is that from the original graph, you can define a dual graph that is on the same set of vertices, but has exactly the opposite set of edges. 
Um, and so we can, uh, and this uh, symmetry will become super important in our proof later. And just note that if you had an edge probability of P in the original, well then clearly now we have an edge probability of one minus P in the dual. And you can sort of start to see hints as to why P is equal to one half is now important. Um, and it's because of the fact that there's a self duality and which means that you, uh, when uh, P is equal to one half, the structure of the original graph and the dual graph are actually the same. And that allows you to say quite a bit. Uh, and let's see. So let's suppose that we have some P less than PC. Well, when C of zero is finite, almost surely. But what does that imply? That implies there exists an open cycle in the dual graph encircling zero. Why is that the case? Well, because what we just said is that the edges in the dual graph exist precisely when they don't cross an edge in the original graph. And so if you have a, a, a finite component uh, that uh, the origin is in, that means at some point um, you have a connected component, you can surround it by a cycle in the dual graph. And obviously, if you have a cycle that's around zero in the dual graph, well, then clearly the um, uh, connected component that contains zero in the original graph is finite because otherwise you, well, you would have to cross the cycle in order to go onto the other side. Um, and so the, 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 these are the sort of key pieces of this proof. Um, so all we need, uh, I guess I should write that down. Conversely, uh, if there exists an open cycle, cycle in dual graph uh, encircling C, uh, encircling uh, around zero, say, around zero, uh, when C of zero is final because it's trapped. So all we have to do is we just need to show the existence of an open cycle around zero to prove that theta of e is equal to zero. So now we've turned this probabilistic question into one that's really geometric. All you have to do is show the existence of some path uh, with non-zero problem, with a high probability, and then you're done. And it doesn't actually have to be high probability. It can't just be non-zero probability, but we'll show how to expand that probability as well. Um, okay, so let's uh, give a really big high level outline and then Tomorrow we'll spend a lot of time on proving all the nitty gritty technical details of how this all works. So we're going to let P be equal to one half. And let's consider the probability uh, of an open cycle in an annulus, I mean a square annulus uh, composed of four separate paths across rectangles. So what do I mean by that? Well, we have the origin somewhere in the middle here. So let's say we have the origin somewhere here and we're going to consider the probability of having a cycle. And clearly the, if you have each of these, then you have a cycle. And so what you can do is you can take the probability of cycle and we can break it down into looking at the probability of having paths across rectangles. And then we're gonna show that there's some non-zero probability of having paths across rectangles and then we're going to make use of the fact that, well, we have this annulus uh, surrounding the origin, but we, have, we, can, we only care about whether there is some open path surrounding the origin. And to do that, we can keep on extending out and getting, looking at bigger and bigger annuals. And so if there's some non-zero probability that this thing here exists, and there's some non-zero, and if there's the same non-zero probability or founded by the same non-zero probability that you have another uh, annulus that goes around, another cycle that goes around and you have infinitely many such cycles going around in the round, well then we can use that to show that there exists almost surely an infinite uh, open cycle. And so that will be the key. Um, and let me go ahead and prove one lemma. Well, I think I still have a little bit of time. So, but of course the key to that sort of um, argument is that we want the existence of a cycle in any one of our analyte to be independent of the size. Because you can imagine a case where you had some probability of a, a cycle in every one of these annuli as you get, uh, get more and more of them. 
but it's dependent on n, and so that probably drops down. And so you don't ever actually end up getting the probability one that there is a cycle. And so we need the, somehow this independence from the size of the rectangle probability that you have a path. And to start, well, let's show that uh, we're going to let R be a rectangle um, by re rectangular K by L portion of the original lattice. And let R prime be the corresponding um, K plus one by L minus one portion of the dual lattice. Um, and what this is going to look like is if we let this one be in blue and this one be in green, well, we have something that's there and something that's there. Okay, because they're slightly offset from each other, right? And so you have something that's <clears throat> K by L, and then the other thing will be, um, oh wait, did I do these? No, I did that right. The other one will be K plus one by L minus one. Okay, and what we're going to prove is there, it must exist uh, when there exists Euler, an open horizontal path, path in R or an open vertical path in R prime. Okay, that sort of makes sense, right? Like, um, I, I mean, it doesn't necessarily make sense, uh, but uh, without looking at it a little bit more carefully, but sort of intuitively, well, if you have a, a, a vertical path, then you can't have a horizontal path in the dual. And if you have a horizontal path, then you can't have a vertical path in the dual. And what we're going to show is that it turns out that those are entirely equivalent. So if you have, um, if you don't have a horizontal path, then you must have a vertical path in the other one because it cuts it off. And so we're able to show that. And I think I should probably end here because that argument's a little bit geometric and I need to do a lot of drawing and I'm still at that. So let's go ahead and end there for today. And tomorrow we'll come back and well, we'll probably the entirety of tomorrow we spent proving this theorem of Harris's that you do actually uh, on the, that theta of one half is actually equal to zero because it will be somewhat involved and with a lot of technical details. So thank you all so much and I will see you guys tomorrow.